This video is continuing on right where the previous video left off. I'm in part 032, miscellaneous plotting, and this video is going to be very miscellaneous plotting. We're going to start with logarithmic graphs, but then we're going to also look at this command called yy axis. Uh, and then after that, we're going to look at bar graphs and pie charts and histograms. This is going to be a high level summary of all these commands. If you need to do anything sophisticated with them, you're going to need to look up more of that on your own. But we're going to start with logarithmic scaling and variety of graphing, plotting things that you can do with that in MATLAB and in Octave. Some of the code that I'm going to present is going to work in Octave and other code is not. I'm going to indicate that on a case by case basis, but this first section, all the logarithmic stuff will work exactly as shown here in Octave as well. All right, so logarithmic scaling, logarithmic graphing is useful for graphing many natural and unnatural phenomena. So let's go look at a little survey of it. The following code is the solution to part four of practice exercise 5.4 from the book MATLAB for Engineers, fifth edition. And my students aren't going to be tested on this material, but that probably doesn't matter to you. So I just ran this section and these are the graphs that are generated. Now, all of these curves are actually graphs of the exact same data just with different logarithmic scaling. Now I do get some warnings that appear in the command window and that's because we can't use the logarithmic scaling on negative data. And it's just telling me that, it's just warning me of that. So actually when I say that this is a graph of the same data, that's a little bit misleading. The first graph right here in the upper left is a standard Cartesian graph of the data that we are using. It is a graph of y equals one over x from negative one to positive one on the x-axis. Now the other three graphs are only graphs from zero to one, not from negative one to one, because we actually can't graph those negative values that are less than zero on the y-axis. So if you just take the upper right corner of the upper left graph, that data is reflected in the other three graphs as well. All right, let's look at the code here. So I'm using subplot to put all of these graphs on the same figure. So subplot 221 means two rows, two columns, first position, which is the upper left. And then I do a basic plot right here of my two vectors, X and Y. I give a title, a Y label. I turn the grid on. I'm using grid on for all four of these so that we can see those grid lines. And then next graph, subplot 2, 2, 2, two rows, two columns, second position is the upper right. And then I say semi-log X parentheses X comma Y. I could have literally just put plot right here and it would also work, but it would be a different plot. It would not have a logarithmic X axis, which is exactly what semi-log X has. And if you look carefully at the graph over here, you'll see the X axis looks maybe a little bit unexpected. It says 10 to the negative two on the left and 10 to the zero on the right. Well, 10 to the negative two is one one hundredth and 10 to the zero is one. So this graph is going from approximately one one hundredth to one. So not quite zero because, well, there's an asymptote at zero for one reason. The y-axis is left alone. It's still linear scaling on the y-axis when we use semi-log x. Compare that to semi-log y right here, first subplot 223, so two rows, two columns, third position, it's this bottom left, and I just use semi-log y instead of plot. It's literally just replacing the word plot with either semi-log X, semi-log Y, or as we will see down here, log log. It takes the exact same inputs, vector of X values, vector of Y values. The only difference is the scaling of the axes when we graph them out. So semi-log Y has a regular X axis, in this case, zero to one. And when I say regular, I mean linear. And the Y axis is logarithmically scaled. It's scaled by factors of 10 as was the x-axis on semi-log x. And then lastly, for log log here in the bottom right, both the x-axis and the y-axis are logarithmically scaled. They are scaled by multiplication rather than addition. Continuing on down. Before I go into this section, let me also mention that as well as having clear and CLC as part of my just little header on each of these sections to erase anything that I was doing before and have a fresh start, I've also started including close all. Two words, all lowercase. This is going to close any figures that are currently open. I highly recommend it because if you don't use it, 
and you've got a figure just like sitting in the background and you rerun another plot over top of it, it won't pop up to the forefront. It'll stay in the background, which like you could just tab over to it, alt tab, and I can go look at it. But I find that that confuses students very regularly. So just add close all right here so the new figure pops up in front and you're seeing it. We've already seen this code before. By default, if I graph two curves or I plot two curves, so a pair of x and y values, another pair of x and y values, they appear on the same plot. All right, so here's what I've got. I've got an e to the x in red, and I've got a sine of x in blue. Now, if you look at that sine of x and you think, well, that doesn't look right, sine of x is a wave. You'd be right. But the problem is, or the advantage, I mean, this is accurate, what's happening is the e to the x has such a large magnitude that the waves, the up and downs of the sine of x, by comparison, look flat, or nearly flat. Now, if we want to compare magnitudes, as we often do, that's correct and good, and this is very sensible. But suppose what we want to compare is the slope, as you might do in a calculus class. Well, we can't really see the two slopes here, so for that, we might want to use what's called yy axis. All the code that I've shown so far works great in octave. yy axis does not. This does not work in octave. Uh, I have not looked up an alternative. Um, you'll have to search for that yourself. The way I use yy axis in MATLAB is, so I set up my vectors. I even say figure to open up a figure that I'm going to use. And then I just say yy axis, a blank space, and then left or right. I'm going to start with the left side. So I say yy axis left. I do need to say this before my plot command. And then I give my plot command. Whatever regular plot you want to do, any sort of formatting, any sort of labeling, great. Oh, and I should say the y label. So both the plot and the y label are going to be associated with the axis on the left side. We're going to have two y axes, one on the left side and one on the right side. So after I'm done with that, I say yy axis right, and then I do another plot, another y label perhaps, and then if I want an overall title, overall x axis, because these are shared by both, I say that wherever. You, I set it down here at the bottom. I think that's a good way to do it, but you could have set it earlier, as long as you did it after the first plot command. All right, let's run this section. Control Enter. This is the exact same data I was graphing one moment ago, where the blue line looked flat. However, now the blue curve is associated with the left axis. And there, on the right side, there is an axis, which is abnormal. Normally, it's just an axis on the left side. But now on the right side, there's this orange or red y-axis associated with e to the x. And we can see, although these magnitudes are a little bit misleading, because the blue magnitude only goes up to 1, whereas the e to the x goes up above 500, but we can see the curves better. We can see the slopes, which may be of interest to you. So that's how to use yy axis. Again, that does not work in octave, uh, and I, I don't have an alternative for that. I haven't looked, but um, I'm just moving past that because this is just a very miscellaneous, uh, breezy section here. All right, bar graphs and pie charts. I've got some very basic data here, just like a vector of five numbers and then a matrix that is two rows of five numbers each. So it's got that data one in the first row, and then it's got one through five in the second row. Anyway, let's go ahead and run this code first, and then we'll talk through it. All right, so here are a bunch of miscellaneous graphs that I've created. And the first one, I use subplot, upper left here. I just said bar, parentheses, data one. And data one's just a vector. And that created this basic bar graph in the upper left. That works perfectly in Octave, as well as in MATLAB. So you can use the bar function there. If you pass a matrix, to the bar function, as I do right here on line 216, well then you just basically get two pair of bar graphs, each of them color-coded. That also works perfectly in octave. Now this next one, bar 3 right here, so it's literally just the word bar with a 3, and then parentheses, and then your matrix of data, creates this three-dimensional bar graph in the lower left. I find this one a little bit hard to read. I think the, there is a limited number of circumstances in which this is the correct graph to use, but there it is for you. That does not work in octave. There's probably an alternative, but I've not looked that up. And then lastly, in the bottom right, pi, a pie chart. Simply use the word pi, parentheses, your vector of data, and this function will automatically divide up your data into percentages. Let's scroll back up slightly and look at our data one vector right here, right? I don't have 5%, 10%, 25%, 20%, and 40% in that vector. I have 1, 2, 5, 4, and 8. 
But it turns out that 8 is about 40% of the sum of all these values. That was calculated for me by the pi function, which I think is kind of useful. Um, there is a way to change the color coding. I know this color scheme is uh, really poor, um, but this is just a, a brief skim through video. I'm not going to get into that. You can look that up relatively easily. The pie chart works perfectly in Octave, just as it does here in MATLAB. Now here's one little extra thing with the pie chart. Suppose you want labels. You don't want just the percentages. Well, and I don't know, I just made these up as an example, but here's a vector of four numbers, and I'm going to say pi parentheses data comma, and then in curly brackets, the labels that I want associated with each. And the order does matter. The two will go with the north, the four will go with the south, three with east, five with west, and it will look like this. This also works great in Octave, this, this uh, code right here with the pie chart labeling. Lastly for this video is histograms. So I've got this big old vector of data right here, relatively large, and I just say histogram parentheses x, and then I'm going to do another one down here. So figure to get a separate figure to pop up, and then histogram parentheses x comma 6. Let me run it and then I'll talk through what this all does. So this right here, figure 1, is my first histogram of data. What a histogram is, is you have a bunch of data and it spans some interval. Mine seems to go roughly from 0 to about 120 here. That interval needs to be divided up into sub-intervals, sometimes referred to as bins. And then, however many of our values fall in each sub-interval determines how tall the bar is for that sub-interval. You can think of it as barrels to catch the rain, and as the rain falls, it fills up the barrel. Each of those raindrops is a data point from our vector. And at the end, we can measure how high the rain is in the barrel, and that tells us how much rain fell into it, or in our numeric case, how many numbers fell into that sub-interval. Now, by just saying histogram parentheses x, MATLAB decides how many bins should be used. I'm not sure if 4 is always the default, but it's relatively easy to change. If I want more bins or fewer, I just say histogram parentheses my data vector, in this case x, comma, how many bins I want. So when I put in a 6, I get this second figure over here on the right. This is the exact same data as is graphed in this first figure. It's the same data, it's just different division of bins. And you can see it looks quite a bit different based on how it was divided up. This does work in Octave, however, you don't say histogram, you just say hist, H-I-S-T. So in Octave, we would just do it like this, and it would also work both of these examples. But for MATLAB, it's histogram. So slight differences there that you would have to get used to. All right, and then that's all for this video, and then I'm going to do some three-dimensional graphing and plotting in the next video.